This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you Episode 17 of Season 2 of the Westford Warsman Podcast. The Westford Warsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, April 24th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago as we read. April 24th, 1909, the first section is the About Town section. Quote, should old acquaintance be forgot, end quote. Well, no, not if they were all like Mr. and Mrs. Lyman Wilkins of North Cambridge, both natives of Westford who were visiting last Sunday at Mrs. Wilkins' old home, the Osgood Osgood Farm on Main Street at Chamberlain's Corner. After renewing the associations of the youthful years at the old homestead, they were in a genial mood to visit old acquaintances of former years. Among those favored with a short but pertinent remembrance were Mr. and Mrs. Hamlet at Brookside, and the Taylor Old Oaken Bucket Farm, corner of Lowell and Stony Brook Roads. That's Sam Taylor's home, the author of this About Town section. Logging on the upper waters of the Stony Brook, between Westford Depot Depot, and Cold Spring, still continues as an industry, and the old arch bridge at the sawmill as a catch basin for the logs reminds one of the old logging days on the Merrimack River. Mrs. Edwin Haywood of Arlington, another one to be listed in the, quote, should old acquaintance be forgot, end quote, class, and a native of the town, was gladly welcomed among old friends last week with all the old time, quote, why, how do you do? I am so glad to see you, end quote. Amos Polly, who just finished planting two acres of potatoes, will all by horsepower. S.L. Taylor, ditto, divided by two, and all by muscle manpower. The selectmen have appointed Wilbert E. Parsons of Forge Village inspector of meat in place of William E. Green, who designed to decline. The appointment fits the situation appropriate enough, although three miles from the center of gravity. Another one of those annual grass fires occurred Wednesday on land of George W. Bussey near Brookside, caused by the usual inevitable closeness of the railroading of the Stony Brook. Needless to say, the brook was not a contributing factor. Several acres were burned over and a narrow escape from entering the forests. A young deer was seen on Stony Brook Road last week near the Arch Bridge, when approached by civilized man, he took to the Stony Brook Railroad track, going west with the fury of speed, as though it had suddenly caught on to Horace Greeley's advice, go west, young man, go west. Uh, Horace, this, is a, this is a reference to Horace Greeley, who was the editor of the New York Tribune in the 18, uh, mid-1800s. His famous advice, go west, young man, go west, and grow up with the country, was published in an editorial of July 13, 1865, shortly after the end of the Civil War. The excursion party from Westford to Washington returned Sunday and Monday. They covered the city all over with sightseeing and hearing, were introduced to President and Mrs. Taft, uh, that's of course President William Howard Taft, and just taken who, who had just taken office on March 4, 1909, and the usual surroundings that go with it, after which the line of march led to an introduction to Congressman Butler Ames. Uh, Butler Ames, uh, born 1871, died 1954, was a veteran of the Spanish-American War and was a Republican congressman from Massachusetts' 5th District from 1903 to 1913 who acknowledged that he had oft heard of Mr. Spaulding in the party, our good-natured chairman of the selectmen. The Mr. Spaulding reference here is to Oscar Richardson Spaulding, spelled S-P-A-L-D-I-N-G, without a U, was born in Westford August 27, 1867, and died here September 28, 1941. He was uh, somewhat of a lumberman and was probably the guy that was shipping all of those logs down the Stony Brook. A short stop at Atlantic City was made on the way home. Dost thou know that this is Arbor Day? 
Hast thou read the governor's proclamation? Dost thou heed its advice for everyone to set out a tree? Dost thou know that Westford would set out 2,600 trees if it heeded this advice? Do not let the commercial spirit of the times so blindly hold thee to this hard task that thou wilt set out bean poles and call it forestry. Uh, the governor referenced here was Ebenezer Sumner Draper, uh, who was an 1878 graduate of MIT and was governor of Massachusetts from 1909 to 1911. The Taylor brothers of the SL type, that is uh, Sam Taylor's sons, William Reuben, age 44, and John Adams, age 39, commenced the lawn tennis season today at the old Oak and Bucket Farm, corner of Stony Brook and Lowell Roads. Apparently, the brothers enjoyed tennis and had a, a court at their own facility, and they quite often played uh, at the tennis court up uh, by the uh, Rodenbush Community Center, not what is now Rodenbush Community Center, formerly Westford Academy. The town was surprised to learn Thursday morning that Charles E. Whitten, for so many years the station agent at Westford Depot, was found dead in the early morning hours as he had retired for the evening. He was a veteran of the Civil War, particulars later. Uh, the next section is Patriots Day. A stirring event on Patriots Day on Monday, our good old April 19th, was the dance at Town Hall, given by the Westford Athletic Association. There was much stirring of feet to the music of the Grange Orchestra. For the season of the year, the affair was well supported. The next stirring affair was the ball game between Forge Village and Westford Academy on the ball grounds near Westford. A large crowd was present. After the seventh inning, with Forge Village in the lead, another stirring event was introduced with an all-promenade movement to it, in which everybody took part, whether they had previous experience in promenade dancing or not. Music was furnished by thunder, and the lightning and rain set everybody into a quick step. Westford Academy is very thankful that it showered, ere Forge Village had them devoured. The other stirring events of the day were mostly a stirring of the soil by the same classification of industry as, quote, fired the shot heard round the world, end quote. Annual reunion is the next paragraph. At a special meeting last Saturday of the Spalding Light Cavalry Association, Captain Sherman H. Fletcher presided and Edward Fisher was secretary. The business was relative to the matter of holding the annual reunion. It was unanimously decided to hold a reunion at Nabnasset Nab Pond next August, and the following committee were elected to make arrangements. Captain Sherman H. Fletcher, Lieutenant Edward Fisher, Westford, Colonel Royal S. Ripley, and Lieutenant W. J. Quigley of North Chelmsford, Captain John J. Monahan, West Chelmsford, Captain H. W. Wilson, Carlisle, Lieutenant E. C. Williams, Groton, Sergeant Charles E. Bartlett, Chelmsford, Sergeant Elmer E. Shattuck, Concord Junction, Sergeant George V. Herring, Pepperell, and David Weston of Pepperell. Nabnasset Pond is picturesque in its settings with its forest preserves and its several hundred acres of parkland owned and controlled by the athletic by the aesthetic sentiment of George C. Moore of Brookside Mills. The reunion last year was a clear case of old-time social and fraternal success, a sort of love at sight, with a plenty of holdover vitality for this year. Plan to be there and have a high wrestling match in the rustle of this tempting feast of beauty by nature with an abundance of crumbs of man. I might mention that Nab Nasset is spelled with, spelled with a double T at the end uh, throughout the, the wardsman 100 years ago. The next center section is the Westford Center section. Henry N. Hoyt, D.D., that's Doctor of Divinity, not Doctor of Dentistry, Secretary and Treasurer of the Massachusetts Home Missionary Society, was the speaker at the Congregational Vestry Sunday evening. A large number came out to hear him and were repaid with a forceful and original presentation of some of the problems of the churches of the old Bay State and the changes taking place therein of the country and city church and the great foreign element problem. There was special music. 
at the Tadmuck Club next Tuesday afternoon. The subject will be Boston, its historical points of interest, and its present attractions. The chairman of the afternoon is Mrs. Benjamin H. Bailey. It is sure to be a program full of interest, and a full attendance of the members is desired for this last working session of the season. The three engineers of the Westford Fire Department met at the town hall last Friday evening and organized. Captain Sherman H. Fletcher was elected chief engineer and John Edwards clerk. It was voted to equip the three fire wagons of the three villages with fire gongs. Wonder whatever happened to those fire gongs. The next section is the Grange. The second meeting in April of Westford Grange was one of unusual interest with its varied attractions consisting of degree work, particularly the work of the ladies' staff in the third degree, the annual inspection by special deputy from the state Grange, and last but probably not least, the harvest feast of the fourth degree. The work of the third degree by the lady staff under the direction of past master Wiley M. Wright was unanimously pronounced the best yet. The ritualistic work was accurate and impressive, and some pretty new features of floor work met with heartiest applause. The fourth degree was conferred by the regular officers in an efficient manner. The inspecting deputy, Elbridge Noyes of Newbury, discharged his duties with efficient tact, complimenting the Grange upon its prosperity, as shown by its well-kept secretaries and treasurer's books, upon the good order maintained, and various other features. He closed with test questions to the various officers and a plea for maintaining the high standard of the educational features of the order. Covers were laid for 200 in the hall below, and fully that number partook of the bountiful supper. Owing to the lateness of the hour, at its conclusion, speech-making was omitted. There were 44 visitors present from Littleton and others from Concord and Chelmsford. Uh, the next section is called A Serious Charge. In the arrest of Ward Eaton Tuesday, the police and detectives working on the case feel that they have the man who last week sent a blackmailing letter to Julian A. Cameron, one of the most prominent men of this village. Last Friday, Mr. Cameron received a letter demanding that he leave $5,000 with a Mrs. Sullivan of Ford's village. Failing to comply with this demand, his house would be blown up with dynamite or one of his children would be stolen. This letter was unsigned and mailed on the Lowell and Air train. A dummy package was put in Mrs. Sullivan's hands, and on Monday night, Eaton called for it, presenting as his credentials a letter which asked him to take it across Forge Pond to the summer cottage of a Mrs. Lyons. Eaton took the package, but returned with it about an hour later, with the seals still unbroken, and told Mrs. Sullivan that Mrs. Lyons was not at home, Soon afterward, followed his arrest by Constable E.G. Boynton, who took his man to air Wednesday morning. The evidence secured failed to convict him, and failing to secure bail, he was taken to Lowell Jail. His case will be deferred for two days for the securing of additional evidence. Eaton is married and lives at Ford's Village and was formerly employed by Mr. Cameron, but of late has worked only intermittently. He has a police record. Mrs. Sullivan is considered an innocent figure in the case. The Mrs. Lyons mentioned is only a summer sojourner at the camp, and it is believed her name was used only as a decoy. This deplorable manifestation of the depravity of some human nature has thoroughly stirred our community, and much sympathetic indignation is felt for Mr. and Mrs. Cameron in their trying experience. The next section is the Graniteville section. All the places of business remain closed during Patriots Day. There was no special observance of any kind, the principal attractions being the ball game at Westford Depot in the afternoon and the Westford Athletic Association dance in the evening. All the schools were closed as usual during the holiday on April 19th. Uh, the next section is called Baseball. The baseball season opened here on last Saturday afternoon when the much-talked-of game between the C.G. Sergeant Shop and the Abbott Worsted Company teams came off on scheduled time before a large crowd of rooters. The AWC won the toss and took the field 
the shop fellows made a good start and before the side was retired had scored four runs. Abbott Worsted scored three in their half and then held their opponents in great shape, preventing them from scoring another run during the entire game. The Mill fellows played a steady game throughout, and although there were a few errors made, it did not have any material effect on the score, the, re the final result being 11-4 to in favor of the Abbott Worsted Company. The battery work of McCarthy and Ledwith was all to the good, for after the first inning, Tom kept them guessing at all stages of the game. Hansen and Prynne excelled in batting, while the fielding of Defoe and Buckingham was up to their usual high standard. For the shop boys, Gardell, Car Charlton, and Howarth led with the stick, while the fielding of Hughes, Brown, and the second base playing of Peter Roke helped the team out of many tight places. Polk caught well, and Gordon worked hard to win, but his fielders did not give him the proper support at times. Harry Hartford of Westford officiated as umpire and did good work, not a semblance of a kick being heard on either side. These two clubs will meet again in the second game of the series in about three weeks. I believe it was a three-game series. The next section is Forge. The services of St. Andrew's Missions, Sunday, were conducted by Reverend Dr. Sherman of Jamaica Plain. Reverend Thomas L. Fisher is taking a, a few weeks rest, hoping to gain strength since his very serious illness. At a meeting of the Board of Selectmen held April 8th, Wilbert E. Parsons was appointed Inspector of Meat for the coming year. Sale and Social is the next section. The Ladies' Sewing Circle, assisted by the members of St. Andrew's Guild, held their annual Easter sale and social in Recreation Hall Saturday afternoon and evening, April 17th. Promptly at 3 o'clock, the doors were thrown open and the sale began. The booths were handsomely decorated. The Misses Helen Lord and Bertha Collins occupied the center booth and did a rushing business on candy. Then came the pond in charge of Mrs. Edith Foster and E. Marion Sweat. Next came the grocery table in charge of Mrs. Herbert Wadley and daughter, Miss Florence. Mrs. R.D. Prescott and Mrs. William Bur Burnett had charge of the ladies' sewing table. The next in line was the flower table in charge of Miss Marion Lord and Miss Annie Cherry. Mrs. Mrs. Sarah Precious and Emily Collins were kept busy dispensing orange aid to the thirsty crowd. The Mrs. Rose Northrop and, Mary, and May Lord had charge of the ice cream and quickly sold a goodly lot. A very appetizing supper was served from 6 o'clock until 8, consisting of salad, cold meats, and cake and coffee. During the evening, there was dancing, Miss Sarah Precious and Harry Brown furnishing music. About $75 were realized, which will lessen the debt of the sheds very much. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending April 24th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you. <laughs>